The information provided by Taming Lightning is designed to provide helpful information and to educate on the subjects discussed. The information provided is true and complete to the best of our knowledge and is not intended to be used without professional guidance and supervision. All recommendations are made without guarantee on part of Taming Lightning and affiliates. Taming Lightning and affiliates disclaim any liability in connection with the use of this information. Taming Lightning is supported by the Pittsburgh Glass Center, who encouraged my exploration, research, and development of a space for plasma and neon sculpture. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is a nonprofit, public access school, gallery, and state of the art glass studio dedicated to teaching, creating, and promoting glass art. World renowned artists come from all over to make glass art. People interested in learning more about glass come here to take classes, explore contemporary art gallery, and watch live glass demonstrations. As one of the top glass art centers in the world, we pride ourselves on providing exceptional resources and instruction to expand the skills and knowledge of our students and artists. We strive to foster a new generation of glass artists and enthusiasts here in the Pittsburgh region. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is an important arts organization in Pittsburgh that is helping the city connect its history as a major producer in glass to its creative future through the innovative use of glass as art. Glass art. We teach it, we create it, we promote it. We support those who make it. As a quick mention, this summer at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, we have two plasma glass classes, a kiln class taught by Ed Kirshner using glass solder and ready-made glass to create plasma vessels, and a hot class I'll be teaching with Pat Collentine, who is my introduction to the world of plasma. Classes will be up by Thanksgiving with registration starting December 1st. For more information, check us out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call our studio at 412-365-2145. I'd like to mention a support option for Taming Lightning, which is coffee. That's ko-fi.com slash Taming Lightning. With this, you're basically donating or giving a tip at the cost of a $3 cup of coffee based on how you think I'm doing, and if you like the project, it's nice and supported. Your donation goes directly to the podcast for means of assisting with audio equipment upgrades, billing or hosting, software and services used in processing the audio, and future travel and professional content. You are by no means obligated to donate, but any support, including commenting and sharing, is appreciated. Welcome back or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Taming Lightning, as well as the Emerging Plasma Tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Taming Lightning Podcast features a series of conversations to help expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium. The intro is Boost by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music and does so for copyright free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 19. In today's podcast, we have Tommy Gustafschuld of Nordic Neon and Diode. He's one of the last neon shops in all of Scandinavia. We hear about his beginnings and early life prior to neon, as well as his recent explorations in making art, whether it be collaboration or his own. What I find interesting is how he processes or bombards his neon tubes using a kiln or oven rather than a high power transformer in addition to coating his own tubes. By the time this podcast is released, I will travel to Sweden as part of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant, where I had the opportunity to visit and travel with Tommy to the glass factory Boda. Here I assisted and taught a hotshot class for plasma with Ed Kirshner and Jaime Guerrero, where we took what we learned from the class in Pittsburgh 
and essentially making a Blow and Glow 2.0. I also participated in the conversation for setting up Neon and Plasma for the Glass Art Society Conference in May 2020, where I will be one of the presenters. Before we get to the episode, I'd like to make a quick mention for the Advancing Black Arts grant, as it would not have been possible for me to travel without the support of this grant and that of the Pittsburgh Glass Center for hosting my residency. The city of Pittsburgh is known for its rich contributions to the canon of black cultural creativity. Cultural experiences and creative innovations have always reflected the expressions and imaginations of people from the African diaspora. The Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh program is where access and opportunity connect with the Pittsburgh artists who are thriving in their creative process as a means and a way of life. Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh is a joint grant-making program created and managed through the partnership between the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. The program is committed to helping create a vibrant cultural life in Pittsburgh and the region. So, again, thank you, Tommy, uh, again, for being on the podcast as well as being uh, a great support for what I'm doing here for the Tammy Lightning podcast. Anytime. Thank you for coming to Sweden. (laughs) Um, so the first thing I usually ask my guests is, um, how did you get into neon? Because you are a a neon vendor here and and arguably the only in all of Scandinavia. Yeah. Two. Uh, and I first came into this business in the mid nineties, uh, 94 actually. Uh, but I started the bending career in 96. So for the first two years, I uh, did all the work that the uh, real benders at the time didn't have time to do or simply just didn't want to do. So I was kind of like this little, I don't have any English name for it, but uh, in Swedish it's tomte. Uh, you know, that little little guy with the gray hat running around. <laughs> I don't, I'm not familiar with that character, but... <laughs> Forget it. Anyhow, I did the, uh, I did the mo- most of the welding of the tubes and uh, uh, the tip-off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's um, uh, another way of, of uh, tip-off uh, in our shop, because... We do it twice. Right, you do... So with that tip-off... You, you see in the oven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not ideal to tip off correctly, direct in the mm-hmm. oven, because of the uh, position of the, the tubes. Right. So uh, you first tip it off uh, from the tubulation that uh, is connected to the manifold, and you try to save as much as you can of the tubulation, uh, and then you tip off the rest that's stuck to the tube so it's big yeah and there's some shops that don't have that kind of constraint but they also do that to get the best positioning for getting the the, the final tube tip off i should yeah. say yeah um but you mentioned something just really quickly or is that you do oven pumping which is yeah. very different from um what most of the world is known actually knows about neon yeah, you know, if anyone knows any idea about neon, it's these uh, using a bombarder yeah. or a high voltage transformer for that. Um, True. Why? Why is it that you do the oven? Uh, several reasons. Um, I think that from the beginning, uh, it's a matter of quality. Uh, by oven pumping, you usually get reach the uh, better vacuum because you can you get it gets harder actually we uh, pump it up to 450 degrees Celsius and that's the the degree for uh, absolute moisture free tubes mm-hmm. by bombarding I think you reach about 375 degrees Celsius so there's still some some uh, amount of moisture left in the tube and uh, there's another reason as well 
bombarding mostly as I see it um, there's a lot of open circuits electrical stuff mm -hmm. and that's not allowed in Sweden okay to work that way and um, we don't even we're not even allowed to use more than 10,000 volts on our transformers and you can apply for uh, special occasions to use 12,000 mm -hmm. and most bombarding systems requires 15,000 I think to work well so there's a lot of reasons for the oven pumping and uh, the third reason I'd say is that we we code our tubes after bending Mm -hmm. We're so different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, therefore we need the ovens to bake the, the uh, phosphor powder. Right. Yeah, it's, you do a lot of things that aren't essentially uh, from... It's not the most common way to do yeah. it. <laughs> you have your setup of phosphor solutions, so yeah. you have a lot of... You have a variety without having to have a lot of different tubes. Yes. And then, you know, from talking to you in the last few days, you also have done things where you have custom color orders. Yeah, we custom get... make colors, actually. Uh, that's pretty unusual, but we have done it. Mm -hmm. And we have done it for the... Um, uh, this, <clears throat> the, um, the casinos in Sweden, mm -hmm. they wanted a special gold yellow. Uh, so we had a we worked on that for about four or five weeks I think, and uh, also a uh, hotel that wanted a special turquoise color. Mm -hmm. And not only is that in phosphor, but that's also in combination with getting specific colored glass tubes made. Uh, in the casino case, yes, because okay. that requires the the noble gold uh, mm -hmm. glass. That's just crazy. I can't it imagine. Is. I mean, and it's fun. It, neon, as I understand it, no, it's just not as it's not as in demand to even have that nature of customization anywhere, and the, having the availability to do that is kind of still blows my mind. Really. Yeah. Well, to me, it's natural. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it's fun, but as I said, it's not so common. But when we when we have the time for it, not so much anymore, because now we're busy uh, being the only shop in the country. But when we were when we had competitors in the country, we had more time for fooling around. Mm -hmm. So we we played a lot with the uh, phosphorus, trying to make different colors and shades. Now, I got to meet uh I got to meet everyone in your crew when I came in, right? Pretty much everyone, yes. Yeah, that was that was awesome. So you have your your wife works with you, right? Yeah, since um almost 2 years. Uh she's she's the one who's coding all the tubes actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and she also put the electrodes on. Yeah, I got to see the coding action. It's yeah. it it it's take it's like um If you think of it, it's like the maze game or maze tube that you can that kids play with. They're kind of rolling the ball through there, except yeah. you're rolling all the solution there, and you have to do it evenly, quickly, and you drain out the excess. And then you also have to put it down correctly too. Yes, you do. You have to put it down with the uh, backside first, so to speak, the the uh, part that won't that's not visible on um, on a sign, because mm -hmm. that's where you have the excess of the solution. It, Well, what what was it that brought her into, you know, joining in on the business uh, for that? <clears throat> she used to work in the uh, healthcare, uh, and that's a rough business, I think, in every country. Uh, you work nights, weekends, kind of low paid, often. And uh, she's been doing that for 17 years. Uh, before that, she was in the restaurant business uh, as a waitress. Um, and before she came, I did the uh, electro job. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, you didn't get to met, meet Miko, uh, no, my pumping guy and my no. welding guy. No, he he also knows how to coat. So he he did the coating before she came in the picture. Mm-hmm. But I I didn't have the time to do both bend bending and uh, putting on the electrodes and uh, the um, the work at the office, the paperwork. Yeah. So um, we basically came to the conclusion that we we need some more. We need two more hands, and uh, so I just one evening I just uh, out of the blue I asked her, "Do you want to work with me?" And she just laughed at me first. Well, <laughs> okay, what will I? What am I gonna do? Uh, so I explained to her for what she's supposed to do, and um, she gave me. She told me that I. Give me the night to think about it. And I said, you you have all the time in the world. There's no problem. Um, took two days. Uh, and she came back and said, okay, I'm willing to try it. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's a good decision because um, working working in healthcare with in the elderly that she's been doing so, for so long, it's it's not f- it's not a hard thing to go back to. Mm-hmm. It's not hard to find a job in that business again so i mean if if you didn't like to do what you do now just go back then right yeah and she loved it she discovered that it's nice to be off and free from work pretty much every weekend Mm -hmm. every holiday no nights so she's still there and i think she still likes it (laughs) the uh, the the most the biggest issue actually was the the fact that we we would be close 24 hours a day pretty much mm-hmm. uh, and m- my worry was that she would be thinking that i would be going on her nerves <laughs> <laughs> but it works fine it's it, we have fun and it's turned out well yeah and then um you have you have a, a set of uh, installers too. Yeah, we have uh, three teams uh, with two guys in each team. Now, do they also do restoration work on signs, or is, they, or is that sent to someone else? No, no, no. We do all the the uh, everything. Hmm. But the LED is at you. I'm not <laughs> LED. I'm not <laughs> just LED. With you. <laughs> I'm not LED. The company does LED. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I run the the neon. Okay. I'm not involved in the plastic stuff. Yeah, that's right. And I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what I didn't catch um, was, did you just kind of fall into neon, or? No, I actually I was in between two jobs. Uh, uh I, I'm I'm a carpenter from the beginning. Uh d- doing construction works. Uh and at that time 1994 that business crashed in Sweden. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh so I had to go and um uh, I basically took the uh, opportunity to walk around in the in this uh, area there where the company was located uh, knocked on doors at every company offering my service for whatever they wanted me to do mm-hmm. uh, and and um, this guy he's from Finland uh, he's dead now passed away a couple of years ago who ran the shop he uh, he told me that uh, no we don't have any use for you we don't have any place we can do anything for you uh, we just got a, a new apprentice a couple of months ago. And I said, fine, okay, thank you. Uh, and I leave my phone number. And this was on a Friday, Monday morning, five o'clock. He called me and he said, can you work? <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. Uh, and I've been in the company since. Nice. Yeah, it's... I started, um, as I said, I started welding and tipping off and doing all this small stuff. Uh, and uh, I, um, on my uh, breaks, I tried the, the bending the best I could. And uh, I, had a, I had the 
opportunity to watch the benders. Yeah. What they did. Um, pretty much as much as I wanted. As long as I did what I was supposed to do. And I had that thing made. Uh, yeah. I could disturb the benders as much as I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. Trust me, I did. Uh, I had a lot of questions. And I, I picked up some tricks and um, I practiced. Yeah. And one day the uh, the uh, owner told me that uh, if you are interested in this, seriously interested, I will learn you. I will teach you. And I I said, yes, please, thank you, teach me. And he did. And then it's been how long in that practice? Like how long have you been doing neon? I've been doing neon for... Uh, if you take off those first two years, it's 23 years now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and I, ha I actually, I went under his wings and practiced. He let me go after seven years. Then that's what it took for me to, in his eyes, be a, a f fully good bender. I say five. <laughs> <laughs> thing is we we work with every diameter up to 22 as re big. as regular <laughs> from 6 big. it's 6 8 10 12 15 18 and 20 and 22 and he had the um, he had this idea that every regardless what what diameter you are working with it's supposed to look the same all the way through all the diameters so mm. it was kind of Long time to learn the bending. Oh, yeah. And then also, what are some things that... Um, I, I've watched you bend. Everyone kind of that's on Instagram will either kind of check you out and see you were doing the 90s and they noticed your setup. You have a pretty pared down setup for your bending. Kind of simple. Yeah, simple. Yeah. And that would be you have a single mm -hmm. fire torch. Yeah. Um you have a hand torch, a single hand single fire hand torch and you have a ribbon burner. Yeah. Um not for the trods though. That's right. a cross burner. Right. Yeah. I don't need any more. What yeah. else should I be I don't know. I'm just need all. <laughs> it's just interesting because I, yeah. I see most people. They're either I see what they will have a hand torch and it's they have it something for, um. Usually the the tipping or spicing yeah. torch. Yeah. Of course, you need that, and then you have a set of crossfires, whether it's a single or multi cannon. Yeah. And then a ribbon burner. Yeah. So similarly, a small set of tools, but it's interesting that your style involves using. A single fire yeah. torch. I do pretty much everything in a single fire. Uh, if I'm gonna do, if I'm gonna do a curve that's longer than about seven, eight centimeters. Are you following me? Yeah, now? yeah. That's about the width of your hand. Yeah, not including uh, your thumb. Then I use the uh, the uh, ribbon burner. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's just a single torch and I do the the welding and the tip off with a single torch hand fire mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's pretty cool so it's a little bit different technique from from most of the others and you do a lot more than signs and yeah. repairs too yeah we do uh, and that's kind of new we, we've been working uh, more artistically uh, since 2014 uh, up till then it was mostly commercial work uh, and um, you get kind of tired of that even if it's not the same bend every time it feels like it's same bend, bending every time yeah doesn't matter if it's a what letter it is or what what kind of figure it is or something like that um you need something to 
to make you grow as a bender or artist, if you want to call it that. I didn't call myself artist before, actually. No? No, I was just a neon bender. Because uh, I, I did something that someone else had came up with. Not my idea. I wasn't the artist. I guess that makes sense. Uh, for me, it did that at that time, at least. Uh, I think it was in 2015, maybe, when I got in contact with uh, the rest of the world, so to speak, in the neon business uh, by internet and Facebook and stuff like that. Uh, I got called artist by others. Uh, and then um, I started working with artists who also referred to me as artist. Mm -hmm. And I started doing own work, not just letters. And I think that's how I became an artist. So now I'm probably a neon artist as well. Yeah. As a neon bander. <laughs> so since then, your your definition of artist has you know expanded. Yeah, uh, indeed. It has. Uh, and... Um, and my love for, for Neon has got even stronger now by working with artists because they have made me push myself and grow in knowledge and technique of doing what I do and so on. So it's mm. great. It's like I'm reborn after 20 <laughs> years in the business. It's really fun. Yeah. And you do sometimes try to sneak in your own work, right? Yeah, I do. That could be tough, definitely. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, while it's kind of a curse, it's really a, a signifier of your a blessing to be able to do what you do anyways. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, if I was brave enough, I should probably let go of the uh, commercial work and stuff and, and just go by, by my own mind and be the artist. But I'm not yet. And I don't want to leave the commercial work because... Nobody else would be here to do it. I need, I need enough commercial work to be able to get an apprentice for full time. That would be fun. And I will get there. Do it's just a matter of time. Do you feel that it's close to that right now? Closer. Closer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Closer every day, I think. You know about my plans to expand the shop and all that. Oh, yeah. I yeah. saw that you're going to move some stuff around and, and then expand it as well, and, which is uh, really cool. The fact that we are sitting here in Boda, Sweden right now, that's a great start because we got Ben mm -hmm. who's coming to, to work with me uh, and learn the Euro, European way of bending. Um, so I, ha I, I basically have to put up a bending station for him. And when he leave, that one will not leave. Yeah. That will stay. They'll be available for the next person to yeah. come in yeah. and learn. And even the idea is even to, to have it for artists that want to come down and bend for themselves, mm -hmm. play around and learn the stuff. So um, there's a pretty big plans going on. Yeah. I mean, you got... I mean, beyond the soft tubes, you're you're thinking about bending boro. Yeah, because um, I, I get the quotation about it sometimes, but I don't have the bonus for it yet. Yeah, any idea why there's an interest in bending boro? I think it's the flame workers that use boro, uh, and they are used to it pretty much. Uh, I think it's simple as that, and when they get the idea of, of making neon. They start bending their own stuff at home and then come down with the product that they made and I can pump it for them because mm -hmm. I haven't got the borrow material for it. I haven't got the burners for oxygen and I haven't got the the uh, right glass in the ovens for it and so on. I could change the uh, tubes on the manifold mm -hmm. uh, to borrow but... Um, I want it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will I, I want to be able to 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 give them the whole thing. And it's also a way of, for me to 
to uh, get better at what I do, working with other type of glass. Mm -hmm. And then also you're interested in plasma too. No, you think? Oh yeah, I mean that's why you're over here, man. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course I'm interested in plasma. It's it's uh, it's fun. Uh, it's close to the neon medium, so. And, and it's not too different from the way that you work, especially no. the way that you process your glass. Yes. So with that, honestly, you may not even need to get a new type of kiln, but you may want to. I I don't think the kiln is the problem actually, but it's the. Um, I mean, that's because your your main ovens have your your manifold on yeah. them as well, so that you may want to have a separate one for that. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I don't know. I I I, I maybe I'm thinking the wrong way, but I, as I said, I want I want to be able to to present both uh, soft glass and, and borrow. Mm. Which I think because of the temperatures you're of it can get to it's it'll work yeah of course and we can crank it up to the double Ooh, that's Nine, good 900 degrees celsius no problem okay now he's got to have now all we need is time right yep <laughs> uh you've worked have you worked with any people that were interested in plasma i thought um i can't say his name correctly Carl Carl Surin. Surin. Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, he's he's not a glass blower. He's an artist. He he does he work in a lot of materials, uh, mostly wood actually, and he's a really good woodworker. But his let me put this right. Both his father and his grandfather were glass workers and designers, hmm. uh, and I believe that his grandfather and his father used to work here in Boda. I actually think we have passed pictures of them in the corridor at the hot shop. <laughs> um, so he, uh, naturally he, he's been working with the glass as well. And he, he made uh, some plasma vessels one or two years ago, one year ago, I think, um, that I pumped for him. And so that, that was fun. He uh, does it. Is it called knitting? I guess knitting or weaving. Yeah, uh, carbon threads. Carbon threads. Yeah, yeah using carbon threads. He's making these fascinating. bags or nets or whatever you want to or call it, uh, and and simply blue glass through that. You get kind of weird forms. Yeah, it's totally awesome. Yeah, I think it's. A, great stuff uh, and we put electrodes on it and pumped it and he he's the one who bought every transformer for uh, for plasma that I had <laughs> <laughs> so I have to get new ones and uh, I haven't uh, yeah we, I don't remember her name but we did some other plasma and that was actually in Boro um, she made this strange Flowers, uh, for me, it looked more like trees uh, out of borrow. Uh, that was supposed to be some sort of installation at a uh, cruising ship down in around Hawaii or something like that. Uh, sad, I don't remember her name. Uh, she was actually the first one with the plasma thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to come to us for help. And then I've been around here in uh, Boda watching other artists with doing plasma. Like uh, Pat? Yeah, Pat Collentine was my first uh, encounter here in Boda with plasma. <laughs> uh, and you learned you learn some from him? Yeah, yeah, I did. That will make us plasma brothers. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Brother from another mother, not mother, but father, maybe. <laughs> it's father, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, he's uh -huh. a fun guy. And uh, now it's Ed Kirshner. Mm -hmm. It's fun watching the uh, the old guys with all, all the knowledge. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're gonna do some. We're gonna light up a few pieces tomorrow. So, take notes. Yeah, I will. And uh, anything you want to close out with? Stay in the fires. Thank you. Thank you. The outro is Zoned Out by Yoakum Karud. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'd like to thank Tommy Gustafschuld for taking the time out of his busy schedule to record for the podcast, his generous support, and offer to drive me down to the glass factory, and for lending a hand in helping plasma and neon grow. Also, I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration, as well as encouraging me to pursue this project and help bring in these artists and instructors to help build and spread their knowledge. And the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge, it connects me to some amazing and supportive people. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe on the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are donations through Coffee, spelled ko-fi.com slash Taming Lightning, where you can donate for the price of a $3 cup of coffee. Links will be provided in the show notes. Feel free to share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.